This video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hi everyone, I'm Corey Ofsted, and my company specializes in designing and conducting real world studies. Today we're talking about inspections of surgical instruments on the clean side of sterile processing. Most sterile processing departments have workstations where technicians can inspect decontaminated instruments to make sure they're clean and in good repair before they're packaged for sterilization. Now this is important because sterilization might not be effective if the instruments are still dirty. In fact, back in 2009, seven patients in Texas got infected after having joint surgery and investigators found tissue and brush bristles inside the bone shavers. They thought that the retained debris might have enabled germs to survive sterilization. After that outbreak, the FDA recommended routine inspection of lumens to make sure there's nothing inside before sterilization. Around that time, a scientist named Azizi at the University of Michigan used a bandsaw to cut up devices like this bone shaver so he could see inside of them. And this is what it looks like. There's all kinds of nooks and crannies in there that'd be kind of hard to clean. He also cut open some suction tips and this one has yellow gunk in it. Seeing this makes me wonder, how could it be cleaned anyway? A brush that fits the stems on either end isn't getting anywhere near the walls on the outer part. And it doesn't seem like flushing with water would work very well either. Now the kicker here is that these are actually single use suction tips, but the personnel didn't realize that they were disposable because they're made out of metal and they look similar to the reusable ones. Anyway, taking a bandsaw to your surgical instruments is an expensive proposition, and Azizi and his team pioneered the use of boroscopes to look inside instruments. And they found all kinds of nasty stuff in lumens, including a chunk of tissue stuck inside this bone, bone shaver here. Now their foundational work was more than a decade ago, so we asked a bunch of sterile processing personnel about their recent experiences with inspecting lumens of surgical instruments and we got an earful. They told stories about seeing everything from blood pouring out of da Vinci robotic arms after they've supposedly been cleaned to dry blood clots that are plugging up suction tips. And all sorts of yellow, brown, blue, red, and black stuff, which is really concerning because visible soil and debris may be accompanied by germs. And the text said they find something really nasty inside Lomans that has supposedly been cleaned all the time, like anywhere from once a week to once a day. This is why they're passionate about inspection, because the tech who packages the instruments for sterilization is held responsible for making sure that they're clean and in good repair. So they start by using their eyes and magnifying glasses to look at the outsides of instruments, and then they use a variety of other tools to look inside lumens. Basically, they purge the lumens with forced air or liquid, like sterile water or alcohol, to see if any blood or chunks come shooting out, or they pass brushes, swabs, or pipe cleaners through the channels to see if they emerge with glop on them, or they use a boroscope to examine the lumen. And anytime they find something really nasty, the instrument or the whole tray of instruments is sent back to decontam for recleaning. So, Let's unpack each of these tools and their pros and cons. Some facilities are using a forced air gun to do what they call a white towel test, which involves blowing air through the lumen to check for blockages and then see if anything comes shooting out under the white towel. Now using forced air like this spooks me, and I'd like you to take a look at what happened when this tech used forced air on an endoscope lumen. So watch between those orange arrows at the bottom. Can you see that fluid spraying out of there? It went all over the place. And I don't like the idea of aerosolizing whatever's inside the lumens after they've been cleaned, because remember, instruments haven't been sterilized yet when techs are assembling trays and washer disinfectors are only gonna wash the outsides of most instruments. Now, to be sure, the techs said they wash their hands and disinfect their workstations whenever they see blood or tissue pop out of the instrument, but I'm not sure that hand hygiene and disinfectant wipes are enough to deal with aerosols like this. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the pros and cons for using forced air. It's simple, it might provide extra drying, which is good, and it could be an option for lumens that are too small for other inspection methods. And ultimately, if something's blocking a lumen, a blast of forced air could possibly blow it out. But I'm uncomfortable with aerosolization and staff exposure. Plus, a high PSA of forced air could damage instruments, and we're not sure that debris or residue would blow out anyway, so it might not work. Now, others have said that they use a syringe to flush lumens with sterile water that lands on a white towel to identify blockages and see if any blood or debris comes popping out. And here's an example of a syringe being used to flush water through a tiny suction tip onto a white sheet. Came out all clear, so the tech feels better about this suction being clean. And frankly, we have found that flushing can dislodge debris that was left behind in endoscopes after manual cleaning, like the chunks of tissue that were flushed out of this channel when we were actually collecting samples from microbial culture. So can you, can you see those chunks right there by the arrows? Now, the text said that their hands commonly get wet when they're flushing water through lumens. And that concerns me because we don't know what's in the water when it comes shooting out of there. Now, we've heard that some facilities use alcohol to flush lumens during inspection. And I've seen basins like this with syringes floating in, in the alcohol. I don't like it. And you can watch our YouTube video on alcohol if you'd like to hear more about our perspectives on that. So let's consider some pros and cons for fluid purges. They're simple and they could be appropriate for checking small lumens, and stuff that gets flushed out with the fluid might be easier to contain than forced air if you're using a towel wrapped around the end. And it could work if the fluid dislodges debris, but you're gonna end up with wet instruments. <clears throat> and of course, the fluid might splash or aerosolize, which exposes the staff, plus it might not dislodge the debris or residue. And it could support the growth of biofilm in instruments if they sit for a while wet before sterilization. Now, let's move on to brushes and swabs. Although gunk should have been removed during cleaning, techs commonly used lumen brushes during inspection. And the techs in some facilities said that their, um, their hospitals provide several different sizes of brushes for this purpose. They also mentioned using brushes like this to see if there's any discoloration on the outside surfaces when they brush it. Uh, essentially, they're doing some cleaning, which is supposed to be done on the dirty side. So anyway, here's a quick look at a tech using a brush to inspect a shaver lumen by passing it through the lumen and inspecting it when the end comes out right here. And here's a brush being used to inspect a cannulated driver which is used for orthopedic procedures. Now, in this case, it emerged with nasty gunk on it, presumably tissue remnants from a procedure. A couple of the texts we talked to mentioned that lumens are commonly still wet when they're inspecting them on the clean side, and they often get spritzed with fluid when the brush emerges and the bristles zoing out. They basically ignore the splash unless they see blood or tissue in which case they will wash their hands and disinfect their, work, their workstations. Now, we used a boroscope to take this crazy little video when we were using a brush to try to remove debris from an endoscope lumen. Although the bristles made good contact with the channel surface, they really just moved the debris around and never really actually pushed it out. And all those little strings and chunks were still there when we pulled the brush out, which really calls into question how well it works to rely on brushes during inspection. In some facilities, brushes aren't even allowed on the clean side, as they're only supposed to be used for cleaning on the dirty side. But supervisors told us that they keep finding brushes and then they toss them in the, in the trash, but then they're back a few days later and they're tucked into drawers, taped under the desk, or squirreled away in all kinds of places. And they're generally used for a whole shift or until they're dirty or damaged. 
Now let's talk about swabs, which are sometimes called instrument inspection tips. This photo shows what came out of a swab we had passed through an endoscope lumen to collect a sample for a microbial culture. And obviously, that little chunk of tissue is not supposed to be there. And last fall, we saw some red gunk inside an ERCP scope, and we used channel swabs to remove it. And we like how well we can see the gunk on the swab, and the good thing is there's no bristles that are going to spritz you when it emerges from the end of the lumen. Okay, let's review the pros and cons. Brushes and swabs are a quick and easy option that create less of a mess than air or water that you're shooting through the lumen. And they could possibly work to identify a lumen that's blocked or grossly contaminated. But again, we're worried about aerosolization and this spritzing that happens when the brush emerges from the lumen. And they can't be used in the smallest lumens and might just push the stuff around anyway. We don't like the possibility that the brushes might leave bristles behind or carry germs to other instruments. And that's a good reason to use a single use swabs for inspection because they may be more effective at removing soil or debris that's in there, make it more visible, and they're less likely to spritz the tech. Finally, boroscopes can also be used to inspect lumens of surgical instruments like this bone shaver or this suction tip. And Tex told us it takes them only a few seconds to make sure that there's no blood clots or tissue stuck inside there. And you can take a look at instruments like this pool suction tip, which has a bunch of holes all along the tube, so surgeons can rapidly remove large volumes of blood or bodily secretions inside bodily cavities. Now these little holes seem like perfect places for blood clots or tissue to lodge because they're out of the direct path of any brush or fluid that you're going to pass through the channel during cleaning or during inspection. And if you look at the interior of the distal end, the part that goes into the patient, it has sharp little claws or teeth that look like they could grab onto tissue or even brush bristles. Now the inside of one of those holes along the tube also looks like it has little claws. And there's a little yellow thing snagged on it. Can you see that? It's right here. We don't know what it is, but a stale processing manager told us it looks like a little somebody has been left inside. And that's really scary. And you know what? This is exactly what Azizi found when he inspected hundreds of shavers and suction tips more than 10 years ago. See all that gunk in that's attached to the interior surfaces of those instruments? They found it took several rounds of soaking and scrubbing uh, with brushes and other tools to try to get that stuff out. And in a lot of cases, it never came out because it had been baked on during steam sterilization. So let's review the pros and cons of boroscope inspections. It does provide direct visualization so we can actually see what's going on inside the lumen. Boroscopes are self-contained and there's no forced air or fluid that could splash or aerosolize. And you can just quickly take a look to identify debris or damage on the interior surfaces. Nowadays, most boroscopes also allow you to take photos or videos, so that gives you documentation as well. That said, there are a few downsides for boroscopes. They may not fit into some of the smallest lumens, and there isn't any guidance about how to interpret what you're seeing. They're expensive, and they only help to detect defects that you can see. Lastly, if the boroscopes aren't disinfected between uses, you could cross-contaminate instruments or you could expose text to germs if they're not wearing gloves. At the end of the day, our patients trust us to protect them. And I think we should be inspecting the lumen of every instrument that has one every time we're processing it. And I know that's a ton of work and there's no one size fits all solution for this. Though I do feel more comfortable using boroscopes and swab tips than blowing air or water through lumens and hoping nothing nasty shoots out of there. But there's actually something else I want you to think about. Texan Decontam expect to be working with highly contaminated instruments, and they're usually decked out in PPE like this. But techs working on the clean side look more like this, just wearing scrubs and a hair cover. They typically touch instruments with their bare hands and they rarely wear gloves or a gown or mask or eye protection. 
because they're assuming that the instruments they're touching are clean and disinfected before they touch them. Now, if things are being done properly during cleaning, they should never see blood or tissue or other gunk when they're handling instruments on the clean side. So I'm going to leave you with this. Why isn't inspection for retained debris and soil being done on the dirty side of sterile processing? They're set up to safely use water and forced air and brushes and other tools for cleaning verification, and they can address issues before anything gets passed over to the clean side and handled over there. Now, I don't want to be naive about the time pressures in decontam, but I really think we ought to start talking about safety for both patients and for the personnel who work in sterile processing, because they're the foundation of safety for the whole hospital, and it should start there. If you'd like to know more about this topic, please see published papers by Tosh and Assisi, and keep an eye on our educational portal and our YouTube channel, because we're doing some research on this, and we're going to be sharing the results as we go. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by email at education at austedinsights.com. This webinar was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark which also provided clinical insights related to the development of the video. Please contact Healthmark directly for information about their products and services at www.hmark.com. We'd also like to thank Healthmark, Jahana Zizi, and Andrew Gens for contributing photos that were used during the development of this YouTube. Thanks again. And take a look at these disclosures if you're thinking about making any changes to policies or practices at your facility.